It's good to be with you again this last Sunday of the year 2020. Soon, 2020 will be hindsight, <laughs> to use a pun. Uh, this is our last Sunday. Do you remember where we were one year ago? Of course, we were meeting in person. Would you have believed it if somebody said there is a coronavirus, a new one that's going to kill more than 335,000 Americans by the end of the year? Would you have believed it if they said it's going to be a worldwide pandemic? and uh, it will lead to shutdowns in every country in the world. No one spared uh, that the stock market would be at record highs by the end of the year, despite all this, that lines at food pantries would stretch for blocks and blocks, that healthcare workers and seniors would be getting a proven vaccine by the end of the year, the same year. Would you have believed it if you were told Grace Church would continue strong, though we would curtail our meetings together, and we would all be around at the end of the year. Uh, we will make it through. And we even celebrated the birth of Avery. And if you count my family, not one, but two Averys, uh, COVID babies. <laughs> and, and so thanks be to God. We have much to be grateful for. And why not just say a prayer of thanks right now? Let's pray. Lord, uh, when we think back to what has transpired during this year, uh, so much loss, so much pain, but here we are, we've made it through, and uh, our faith is in you to make it through the next year too. And so we give you thanks that we know you're watching out for us and that we can cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now, what is ahead? What's ahead? And I'm not talking about the year 2021. I'm not going to venture a guess, although I'm also not going to put my money on the Warriors to win the championship <laughs> this year. Some things we can, we can guess, but I don't want to guess. Uh, but I will tell you with certainty that for believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, we know uh, the most important things about the future, and we have every reason to hope and live each day with love and joy and peace. And in a word, uh, that reason for hope is heaven. Carol, you have uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. And to set the context, in the previous chapter, chapter 11, verse 30, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. I will boast of the things that show my weakness. So then in 2 Corinthians, he says, I must go on boasting. So, Carol, would you read 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4? Okay. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Okay. The Apostle Paul says, I was caught up into the third heaven, which implies there is a first and a second heaven. And I think what Paul means by that is when the Bible uses the word heaven, it's the Greek word uranos. And uh, it means, uh, for one thing, the sky. So if you, you look up into the sky and you see that blue sky and the clouds and uh, the birds flying in the air, and as far as the eye can see, the naked eye can see, you see the sky. That's the first heaven. And so then the second heaven would be space, the moon and the planets 
and the stars, as far as we can see with the telescope, the Hubble telescope, the universe. And Genesis 1.1 refers to the second heaven when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then the Bible also speaks of heaven, and it's not talking about the sky. It's not talking about space, but it's talking about God's home, uh, the presence of God, where God is. And so this is what Paul is referring to here when he says uh, he's talking about inexpressible things. And so he says, though heaven cannot be described, it's inexpressible. Um, we know some things about it, and that's what I want to talk about today. But much of what scripture tells us about heaven is an attempt to use human language to describe something that is way beyond human experience, right? We've never had experience with it, and so we don't have words for it. Those of us who don't live in snow country, uh, we sing about, you know, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, and we sing, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. And we have basically, had, we have one word for that white stuff that comes out, comes from the sky, snow. But if you're a skier, you have a few more words for it. Uh, you might have fresh powder, and that's referring to snow that's still dry. And when you ski on that, you sink down through it. Uh, but then you also have California concrete, and that's what we often have up in the Sierra. And uh, that's much harder snow. And you could add sleet. Uh, to it and, and hail is sort of a, a, a frozen stuff that comes out of the sky. And you added a few more words. And then I'm told the people, uh, the natives of, of Alaska, they have many more words for snow because they live in it. And so, um, but what words do we have for heaven when we haven't experienced it? Um, there are no words to express. And so the Bible is limited and just has to use the the language that we have uh, and the adjectives that we have to describe heaven, the same for God. How do we describe God who is infinite and eternal? Can you even conceive of what is it like to not be bound by time and space? Yeah, that's, that's God. And so we have to use anthropomorphic language to speak of, of God. And the Bible is the same when it talks about heaven. So it talks about streets of gold, for example streets of gold and uh, uh, crowns that we'll be rewarded with and that be cast at Jesus's feet. Talks about crossing the river uh, over into the New Jerusalem. Speaks of heaven as New Jerusalem. Talks about choir singing and, and uh, you picture heaven. I used to, as a kid, I, I thought heaven was where we're all in choir and we sing all the time. <laughs> and, and even the word place where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. We can't help but think a place uh, like um, San Francisco is a place. Golden Gate Park is a place. And so we think in terms of time and space. And the word body, we have a body here on this earth. What's it like to have a body that's in heaven that's outside time and space? So if heaven is inexpressible, then we need to be careful about taking this, these expressions literally and physically, suffice it to say heaven is real. These inadequate expressions raise questions if you take them too literally. For example, streets of gold, gold which is very valuable because it's rare, uh, will it be valuable in heaven if all the streets are paved with it, <laughs> if it's not rare anymore? And then it raises the question, does that mean we're gonna get around in cars, uh, bicycles, horses? How are we gonna get around? Uh, Jesus, it says, sits on the throne of heaven, sits on a throne, and we will wear crowns, we'll be given crowns based on the good works we've done, and we cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. Well, for those of us who don't have a king or a queen, I, the only crown I've ever worn was the one made of cardboard that you get from Burger King, and I'm thinking Jesus might be insulted if I throw that at his feet. Well, crossing the river or the New Jerusalem, I haven't been to Jerusalem, but I've seen pictures, and I think I prefer San Francisco. Even if <laughs> Jerusalem was brand new, I don't know if I would prefer that over <laughs> Petaluma. Uh, how do you feel about choir rehearsals? When I used to think of heaven as a child, I was in a children's choir, and I didn't really like choir rehearsals. And the idea of heaven being a place where we just sing nonstop was not appealing 
to me. Um, now, if you could talk about heaven as being a baseball game that never ends, uh, <laughs> I could conceive of that, and that sounded appealing. And, and the word body that Paul uses to describe um, our heavenly bodies in 1 Corinthians 15 it raises the question, will I be the same height and weight that I was at 20 or at 40, at 60? Well, we can get tangled up in these things if we think of, of all these words in a physical and literal sense. Uh, but Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So what can we know about heaven? In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, I read it often. I used to I used to have it memorized. Maybe I still do. And uh, such an important scripture for me. And Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way <laughs> to the place where I am going. So three times Jesus uses the word place. And so Thomas, who <laughs> often asks the questions I would like to ask if I was there, he's thinking place, okay, uh, we need to know where that is and how to get there. More importantly, we need a map. And so Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if heaven is a place, uh, like um, North Beach is a place in San Francisco, then Jesus' answer is not very helpful. He doesn't give us a map. He doesn't give us directions. He doesn't even point and says, well, heaven is up. Sometimes people say, where's heaven? It's up. And... Uh, you know, when Jesus says that he lifted his eyes to the heaven, to heaven, to talk to God, I think it's talking about the place where God lives, lifted his eyes. Well, up in Israel is not the same as up in the United States, right? So we're going to be going in different directions if, if that's the case. And so uh, is it a house like a mansion in Atherton? If so, it raises questions. Um, and where is it? Uh, can we see it? Maybe if we had a telescope more powerful than the Hubble telescope, would we maybe be able to see some of the lights that come up from the city of the New Jerusalem? Well, if it's a literal place, there are all kinds of logistical problems. For example, how can we be in the presence of Jesus in, in Jesus's, uh, at his throne in the house where God lives? all millions or billions of us through space or through time and uh, throughout the world. How can we all be considered to be in Jesus's? I don't like to go to concerts that are in big arenas because you, you can only get close through the video screen. You see the video screen better than you see the actual people on the stage, at least the tickets I get. And so then I think I might as well stay at home and just watch a, a video of this and, and get a better view and, and probably better sound and I can my ears won't be ringing, ringing after it's all over. And so how does that happen that we can be in, in uh, well, we think in, in terms of our three dimensions, right? And uh, for example, um, let's say you have two lines. So I have this sheet of paper here and I draw uh, two lines that are not quite uh, parallel. Uh, we know those lines are going to intersect. Uh, they're infinite lines and they're going to intersect. If you just follow it farther, then how, how do you not have them intersect if you're writing that on a piece of paper? Well, that's because we have two dimensions, uh, height and depth, or um, height and width. But what if you add a third dimension of depth? Then we don't worry about the lines crashing into each other because we don't, we're not limited by uh, height and width, but we add depth. And so lines can completely miss each other. So it, it's a different world if we think in terms of three dimensions. But what if, as Einstein proposed, there is a fourth dimension? 
beyond time and space? What if there's a fifth dimension? Well, it's hard to conceive of. That's not our, that's not the experience uh, that we have. And so, but maybe heaven is a place in that sense that it's more than three dimensional. Well, I'm getting into philosophy here and I'm starting to, to confuse myself and maybe you too, uh, but uh, let's get back to the scripture. Clearly, Jesus wants us to know how to get to heaven, but he doesn't give us a map. Instead, he says, uh, what's the way to heaven? He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so he's pretty much saying, you focus on me, and that's all you need to know to get to heaven. You don't need directions beyond that. If you could combine the wealth of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all the technology of their respective space companies, you would not get a thousandth of the way to heaven. And so it's beyond our conception. But what can we know about heaven? I think we can know four things at least that I'll talk about today. One, heaven is real. Whether it's a place like Golden Gate Park or a place in, in a fourth or fifth dimension, heaven is real. And we who are followers of Jesus Christ will experience it. That's the point that Jesus is making. And this is our hope. Sometimes heaven is described more by what it is not. Uh, like Elo Eloise said, there's no sin in heaven. And uh, there's, the Bible says there's no more weeping in heaven. There's no more death in heaven. There's no more pain. There's no more blindness, disability, or incarceration. Jesus said the blind see, the lame walk, the prisoner is set free. There's no more death. There's no, it's described as eternal life, life that never ends. There's no end. Everlasting life. And so heaven is real. And the scripture talks about it in both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, that heaven is uh, an existence where, uh, take David in, in the 23rd Psalm, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the presence of God forever. Well, the second thing we can know about heaven is that you belong in heaven. And this is so rich. You belong in heaven. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, speaking of those who place their faith in Jesus Christ and express their faith through following Christ in their attitudes and actions. And he says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Think about that for a moment. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Each of you is a citizen of some country. Uh, the United States may be in a different country, but you're a citizen. Uh, one, one song that really gets to me is Eric Clapton when he sings Tears in Heaven. And he's talking about his, his child who died, um, fell from a window and died. And Eric Clapton sings this song of grief called Tears in Heaven. And one of the, uh, the lines that really gets to me is he sings, I know I don't belong here in heaven. I know I don't belong here in heaven. I have friends who were born in Mexico and they made their way to the North Bay because they needed opportunities and they needed money and our economy needed them. But they've not been able to become citizens here or even get a green card. Uh, they're undocumented um, residents. They're sometimes called illegal aliens. They live with a constant awareness that they could be detained and deported. Imagine what it's like to live that way. As an aside, let me say we should be ashamed that we live in and we benefit from a system that treats our neighbors and workers this way, especially people who are descendants of the people who used to own this land. Remember, uh, California used to be Mexico before our time, 
And before that, it was the Ohlone Indians, Native Americans. And so, but let's not be ashamed. Let's change the system to a more just system. And I'm hopeful we can do that uh, in the future and hopefully soon. We don't want that for our country and we don't want that for heaven, certainly. We are citizens of heaven. You never need to feel like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here in heaven. We're not imposters. We're not illegals. We belong. We're full citizens of heaven with all the rights and privileges that go with it. So heaven is real. You belong in heaven when you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And third, heaven means being with Jesus Christ. For all we don't know about heaven, this we do know. And this is the most important point. Heaven is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus isn't just the way to heaven. Jesus is the destination. What we see in Jesus, unconditional love. To be in the presence of one who loves us without conditions, without end, loves us just the way we are. To be in the presence of people who love us unconditionally. That's one of those inexpressible things we can't conceive of. Because uh, people will let us down. Uh, even family members will let us down at times. But Jesus never will. To be in Jesus's presence, to experience uh, the mercy and forgiveness of God, to experience compassion and empathy. No more holidays alone. No more evenings at home alone. Never alone. Always in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's what heaven is. Uh, Jesus says it in John 14, verse 3, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I am, you may be. You're with me. If this is physical and literal, I don't know how that can work. All millions, all billions of us in the presence of Christ at once, at once but somehow it's real and we'll experience it. Luke 23, 43 says, Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, speaking to the thief on the cross. You'll be with me. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Philippians 1, 23, Paul writes, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. In another place, Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And so heaven is all about Jesus and all about that Jesus Christ represents unconditional love. If that's attractive to you, I don't know if singing in a choir for eternity is attractive to you, but if it's attractive to you to live in the presence of unconditional love, acceptance, then heaven is an, an attractive place. I wanna be there. Number four, we believers will be transformed. And this is important. We won't be the same people. Uh, heaven is a new and improved place, a new heaven and a new earth it's called. It's called a new Jerusalem. But more importantly, you and I are new and improved people. Fit for heaven. I remember as a, as a child going to a, a, an amusement park and, uh, and one of the rides was we all got into this bowl. It's a big wooden bowl and we were told to sit against uh, the outside, the wall of the bowl. And so once everybody was in position, then they started the ride, which was this bowl started to spin slowly, picking up speed. And then it spun so fast, we started to feel pressure, not down as in gravity, but outward, centrifugal force. It was a centrifuge, essentially. And then to make it more fun, the bottom started to drop out of the bowl. And so we were pressed. That's the only thing holding us in place is we were pressed against this wall. And I don't remember if I enjoyed the ride or not. What I do remember is that when I got out, I felt like throwing up. And so I just crawled over to a, a cool, quiet place. And I sat there 20 minutes, sick as a dog. And I had these conflicting thoughts. I thought, I want to get in line for the next ride. I'm missing out. But at the same time, I'm so sick. I, no, none of those rides are appealing to me. And uh, 
<clears throat> and I thought, um, what good is it to be at an amusement park and be too sick to enjoy it? <laughs> and I would feel, um, I mean, what if we were in heaven, but not healthy enough to enjoy all the splendor of heaven? If we're too morally sick, you're not righteous enough to enjoy it. Uh, you're morally terminally ill. Uh, you'd feel like an imposter the whole time. Like in The Good Place. You know, I don't know if you saw any of that TV show. I saw some of the beginning episodes. And they're all wondering how uh, all these beautiful people in heaven, how am I here? And they kind of kept it a secret that they knew they didn't belong. When I go to Warriors games, I always wear basketball shoes. And I probably told some of you, it's just in case. Just in case there are some injuries and uh, they need somebody to come take the court and play, you're laughing. And you haven't even seen me play, but you're right to laugh. Uh, but imagine it actually happened. You know, imagine on the loudspeaker, they say, oh, David Widewood, please follow the ushers and report to Steve Kerr. And I went down there and they suited me up and I've got my basketball shoes and they send me out on the court. What would happen then if my fantasy actually came true and I'm playing alongside Steph Curry and Draymond Green? It would be kind of exciting, at least until they pass me the ball. What am I gonna do with the ball? How am I gonna guard LeBron James or the worst <laughs> player in the NBA? How am I gonna guard them? Uh, I don't have a chance. I, I don't have the height. I don't have the skills. I'm certainly not in game shape. I'm trying to compete with men in their 20s to be on the basketball court and not have the ability to compete with the best players in the world. It would be terrible. I would just hope it's not on TV. <laughs> it would be a viral video and not in the good way. Well, a lot of people want to go to heaven, but they want to go with their raggedy clothes and their judgmental attitudes and their selfish desires. And we still want to gossip and criticize people. We want to keep our jealousy and our greed. Nothing would be more disappointing than to be in heaven surrounded by righteous people and still be the same old creaky guy that I am. But that's what heaven is. It's a new improved environment, but it's a new and improved you and me. We're transformed. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. We will be changed. We will be transformed. We won't just be in heaven. We will be heavenly. And, uh, and so heaven is a place where you and I belong and will be transformed, will be fit for heaven. There's one more thing I want to say about heaven, and scripture is very clear on this, and that is heaven is an opt-in place. We have to opt in. In the words of Jesus in Revelation 3.20, he paints this picture. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. In this picture, it, to use this metaphor, it says we have to open the door. Jesus can knock. Jesus can ask. But we have to open the door. You have to consent. If heaven is not what you want, if being with Jesus is not what you want, you will not be forced into heaven. Uh, in San Francisco, we talk about the unsheltered in San Francisco and throughout the whole Bay Area, and questions are asked, can you force somebody, uh, a drug addict, into recovery? Or is that a violation of their rights? And would it even work? Um, can we force a mentally ill person to take medication? Or would that violate their rights? And wherever you come on that, on that, uh, there's probably some happy medium between uh, forcing people and, and uh, against their rights and just leaving people as they are to set up tents wherever. But when it comes to heaven, Jesus does not force anybody in. We have to consent. We have to 
hear the knocking at the door and open the door. And we do that through prayer and through faith. We say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. Uh, make me a child of God. Give me the Holy Spirit so that I can follow you in all of my life. We have to open the door. And this is our hope. This is our hope, heaven. Where will we be one year from now? The end of 2021, we don't know. We don't know if we'll still be around. But as followers of Jesus Christ, our hope is this, no matter what happens, vaccination or no vaccination, virus or mutated virus, we don't need to worry. We need to be careful, live carefully, but we can say with Paul, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. And then here's the question. It's a question for a different sermon, and I talk about this sometimes. Why wait? Why wait for heaven? I'm not talking about euthanasia, I'm volunteering for suicide or anything like that. I'm just saying, when we pray, Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as in heaven, we are saying we don't want to wait until we die and we're in the presence of Christ. We want heaven now. Lord, transform me into that heavenly body through, through your Holy Spirit. Lord, use me to make this old earth into a new earth and a new heaven and to transform this place where we live. We don't have to wait. I want to close with a prayer that was written by, uh, we believe, Martin Luther. He would have written it in German, but it's translated into the English. And we know it as the song, uh, Away in a Manger. And I love the third verse, and it goes like this. And this is, this is my prayer. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy, thy tender care, and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Amen.